saints <clears throat> this live session you see my lip is actually still swollen from boxing <laughs> and one thing you guys want to remember when you're boxing is don't forget your mouthpiece sometimes i might perceive someone as not a threat at all i forget my mouthpiece i almost never wear headgear <clears throat> which you should wear headgear for sure i freaking forgot my mouthpiece that idea anyways we got some good work in shout out to the saints anyways um i want to share with you all the experience with vice news in as much as um, obviously, they're putting together uh, a project which they've uh, termed to be a documentary on masculine content. And um, they reached out to us and said, hey, we'd like to interview Marquette, see him in his element, understand uh, why people follow him, uh, his message and his way. And frankly, as soon as they reached out, we knew that it was because masculine content has been uh, reaching uh, more ears. It's also been something that the mainstream is starting to uh, acknowledge just due to profitability and views, right? And we're seeing folks like uh, Pierce Morgan and other more established outlets allow on the likes of an Andrew Tate and other Manosphere influencers uh, such that <clears throat> allowing on other Manosphere influencers such that they can basically pick up some of that audience. And so, of course, Vice News is no different. And reasonably, they can look at certain individuals or certain movements and see that some are moving faster than others, some are more legitimate than others, some are realer than others, and undoubtedly, um, we're about to win. So... Not surprised. And, you know, the question at that point, knowing how they did Tate and how they've done other uh, persons, be them in the manosphere in politics or otherwise, Vice is a left leaning outlet. We knew that it would be a hit piece and especially a hit piece uh, with regards to the saint in the center and the sass and in as much as Marquette Devon Burton is a threat because Marquette Devon Burton and his work is highly practical it's on the ground meaning it's offline not just online it's highly organized um, my people actually really follow me whereas the other folks in the space are clearly making a cash grab they're entertainers um, they're just reacting to news they're engaging in celebrity gossip they have no greater ambition they have no greater aims and very limited skills in the way of organizing. And so always, you know, the, the power structure is going to be taking a close eye to those things that are more effective. So that's that. Oh, and by the way, for those of you who want to send in questions, comments, or support the work, you can do so using the information below. I do want to first acknowledge uh, the one person who sent in support. Shout out to Marcos, writes, Peace to the Saints. Tuition for the master class we'll witness. I appreciate that. Shout out to Marcos and his family and this lady. I uh, hope you all are enjoying life and uh, living well and all things are easy and even easier than you expected. Anyways, so they reached out to our team. Hey, you know, we like what you're we like what you're doing. And we'd like to come check out Marquette, check out uh, the Saints and the Sass and, and see what you're about. So we say, OK, sure. Now, as I said, we know they do hatchet pieces. And the question that you uh, come to is, will the benefit outweigh the bad? And a simple person would say, no, don't do it. They're going to misrepresent you. They're going to be negative, but an experienced person and a strategic individual realizes, especially when you understand human nature, that there are certain persons that will not like you no matter what. And there are other persons that will hear what you have to say and know that it has the ring of truth. They can look at you and assess authenticity and competence. And as a result, um, they will indeed embrace your message. There's no amount of propaganda and lies that can you know, keep the truth from someone who's intelligent and discerning. 
And so what we know now is that, or rather what informs people know is that when you get more exposure, certainly you'll get more hate, but you'll also receive more love from those who are wise and informed. And in my case, all I need is exposure. Our message just needs greater dissemination. And so I said, okay, I will take this as an opportunity for dissemination, though certainly I don't want more hate. And in fact, I, I really don't want to be personally exposed more to people, meaning I'm an introvert. I, I don't love being in large crowds. I don't love being uh, engaged by strangers or you know, people reaching out to me. You know, People nowadays are, are very peculiar. Like they send me DMs and things like that. It, as the I'm like, you're a stranger. I don't, I don't want to talk to you. If you're one of the members, that's a different thing. If you're one of the saints, that's a different thing. But strangers will reach out and try to engage in conversation. I'm like, I'm, I'm not interested. Please don't reach out to me. I am an introvert. I, I don't want to do that. So certainly I realize that there's a balance, which is to say that with more exposure, <clears throat> it'll push me into a certain life experience that I don't entirely want. But I do find that the work is more important. And so achieving that goal is more important to me. So anyways, we said, okay, we'll take the opportunity. However, I must concede that I don't trust Vice at all. Generally, I don't trust strangers, but I certainly don't trust Vice because they have a, a track record of, shall we say, bad behavior. So I'll tell you uh, what occurred. Uh, shout out to Gwensley supporting the work. Always good to see the saint. Pleasure to meet. I also acknowledge Ron comes in by a cash app, writes Peace of the Saints. Appreciate you. Shout out to the real ones. And also shout out to Brandon, who just became a member at thesassin.com. That's T-H-E-S-A-S-N.com. We invite you all to membership. And in fact, I'm going to put up an exclusive for the members. I end up um, having to beat up one of the vice staff members. And so we got the video of that. Uh, so you'll be able to see that as a, a member. Uh, shout out to uh, Charlie, writes authenticity. I appreciate that. Shorty writes, when will you get married? Send me a DM. Let's see if you're qualified. It's uh, somebody dropped my IG for her. It's Instagram.com slash Marquette Devon. It is time to start dropping some seeds. Anyways, so I know I know Vice is shysty, right? So um, when they said, hey, we want to come check you out, I don't trust anything about them, especially leftists in general. They're not reliable people. They're not honest people. They're not upright men. They don't even know what a man is. So you can't take their word uh, at any level. So they say, we, we want to come check you out. I was like, okay, cool. Fantastic. So uh, my team says, hey, we have an event coming up. If, if you'd like to come check it out, feel free. So they're going back and forth with my team. And as I said, I don't trust them at any level. I don't believe anything they say. Everything has to be verified. Um, anything that they do or say is going to be viewed with suspicion by myself and uh, my entire team. Appreciate you, Cash Kid. That's Marquette Devon at I, on IG. And anybody who wants to see how bosses live, you heard me, how bosses really live, real bosses, uh, check me out on IG. I do the things that you cannot fake. So anyways, Okay, shout out piece of the saying she might need to hop on that IG too. Because again, ladies, I am ready to start dropping some seeds. So, you know, submit your applications. Let's see if you're qualified. Um, please, no children, uh, meaning like no single mothers, all love, but, you know, probably not going to drop a seed in you. And um, yeah, we can go from there. Anyways, so they, they get the invite. And we're proceeding with the event. And it was a very busy and you know unique time in my life. As I've uh, said, I've only been sick two times in my life. And in both cases, it was from a man-made disease, COVID-19, the coronavirus. And so I'm certain that this government of ours and the governments around the world are largely wicked. Um, so if you guys don't know, and I talked about this during the Book of Dark Truths, and this is one thing I'm willing to share with you all, gain-of-function research, which occurred in Wuhan, China, was funded by the United States. It occurred on the land of our enemy. And that research is about increasing the transmissibility of diseases, meaning making it easy for diseases to be communicated or given to other persons, pathogens, influenza, things like this. So in as much as that's the case, they were trying to make it more deadly, essentially a biological warfare weapon. So unsurprising, I've been sick two times in my life, both times it was by a man-made pathogen. 
that somehow spread around the world as a pandemic and no one knows how it happened. Super sus. But anyways, I was just recovering from that. I'd left Singapore. I was sick as a dog then and I was recovering. And you'd never know because I keep working, keep hustling. You dig? Um, and I'd gotten back to the States and I wanted to put on the Book of Dark Truths very quickly for a couple reasons. Number one, I have this court case. I despise the government. I don't trust them at all. They've been trying to take me down for years. Um, we've been in protracted warfare. And so I got this trumped up fake court case that I have to go in for. And I say, I want to make sure I can get out as many truth and share as much knowledge as possible um, before this fake trumped up court case. Number one, because you never know what I'll say uh, in the courtroom because I don't respect the judge. I don't respect the legal system. I wouldn't be shocked at all if I said something wild and they held me in contempt of court and gave me a, a week to a couple months in jail just for saying some hood shit. So I was like, let me get this um, this book of dark truths out. Uh, so in case they take me down, um, you know, much of the you know the real pieces of functional knowledge I have are already in the saints. So we at the event coming up. I said uh, my team told Vice, you guys can come out. And truth be told, it wasn't really on my mind that they're coming out. I didn't care. I didn't trust that they'd come out. I didn't trust anything about it. So it's irrelevant. Um, as it was getting closer time for them to come out. They reached out to my team, said, uh, hey, can you give us uh, Marquette's number or the phone number of someone who's on site just to make sure that it's you know easy for us to get into the location once we arrive? And we were like, no, no, we're not giving you anyone's number. We'll give you the address. And if you can figure it out, fantastic. If not, <laughs> if not, you don't. Shout out to D. Haven supporting the work. Appreciate you. Writes Peace of the Saints. Shout out to the Saint City Saints. Dave writes, damn, Saint. You had to put hands on somebody, violence ain't cool, but when necessary, lay godly hands in a real way, in a real way. And, and I'm not going to say violence ain't cool. You know, violence is what it is. That's, that's all I'll say. Shout out to Aiden supporting the work. Appreciate you. He was at the Book of Dark Truth Summit. And I also acknowledge Jalen. He writes, for that live on money and self-improvement, I appreciate that. That's an important one. Shout out to Cole supporting the work. Writes, peace of the saints. Cole was on the men's trip. Shout out to Joel Acuto. Writes, leave a like on your way in, saints. Absolutely. So anyways, you can tell the level of distrust that we have with them. That we're like, nah, baby, share the phone number. You mess around and leak uh, our, our phone numbers. We're not going to do that. Shout out to Victor. He writes, peace of the saints. We, the true saints. Uh, I have your back as long as you can speak. Rough patch for me, but you are making me see the light. You make us move. I have decided to move out of the country in five years. Legal reasons. Any advice? Yes, my advice is to identify a country that's suitable for you. And depending on the nature of your legal reasons, identify a country that you can blend into, which is to say if you're white, you, you wouldn't be wise to move into Sudan. You'll be easy to spot. Also find a country with a reasonably stable uh, monetary system, you know, stable currency, reliable banks. And, you know, I think you'll be good. Shout out to EJ, right? Supporting the work piece of the Saints. Appreciate you. Shout out to the real ones. That's all that matters. The real ones. So anyways, um, they, they say, hey, can we get a phone number? We're like, no, nah, we don't have any phone numbers. You, you know, just show up. And if you, you're able to get in, you're able to get in. So anyways, um. We're prepping the event, and uh, in the morning, you know, I see one guy walk in front of Sasson HQ, who did <laughs> this guy said you did a fake Vice interview. You're a funny guy. Um, just side note on mental illness and haters. I was looking at a, a Floyd uh, reel on Instagram, which I'm a big Floyd fan because he is the greatest fighter ever. He's also a phenomenal businessman. And on the reel, he, you know, and the reason I clicked is because I was looking at the background was gorgeous, but I recognized it. He was in uh, Dubai at a particular resort that I've been to. And so he's there wearing a big chain, diamonds dancing. And he's, you know, sounds like he's promoting something. And I went to the comments and the comment says, the, I couldn't believe it. The top comment says, and some dumb black guy writes, Hiding loneliness with wealth. And I was just like, Jesus Christ. The level of hate. I was like, first off, that doesn't even make sense. From a logic standpoint, it doesn't make any sense what you just said. Secondly, just the level of hate. You know, dude is in a video 
halfway around the world in a very wealthy, peaceful country, looks very happy, he's well dressed, diamonds dancing like Michael Jackson. I'm sure he got a couple of females off off camera. Um, he, he's prospering, he's happy. And one thing anyone who's ever been successful at any level knows, as soon as you have money, clout, fame, notoriety, recognition, people are going to be around you. Tons of people, strangers, friends, family, women, all of that. So point is to suggest that he's lonely is just, it, it's not even sensible. It doesn't make any sense. But even if that were true, say that were true, the fact is, why does that matter to you? <laughs> why does that matter to you? That has nothing to do with the video. Why is that what comes to your mind? You're jealous, my boy. And it's just sad to see such hatred and persons like this. There's really only one solution to them. I ain't going to say what it is, but they're black hearted and wicked. Anyways, so I see one guy who, who looks quite unusual walk past SAS and headquarters and I have a good sense of the community. I, I chose to move into a community with high foot traffic for SAS and HQ because I want it to be a community center for our people and also perhaps a place where others can come and learn. And so I pay attention to the foot traffic. I'm very much so a cognizant and observant individual. And I noticed this person, they look like they'd fit into the neighborhood, but they weren't from the neighborhood. And they kind of walked by slowly and looked in, which is not unusual. And then later on, I see a, a number of Caucasians show up. So I knew for sure it was the vice team. Uh, we go over, uh, let them in. At this point, my captain's there. Uh, they come in, they're exceedingly friendly. They start setting up their equipment. And there's uh, one gentleman who's from Mexico. He actually lives in Las Vegas. Seems like they used him as an independent contractor to do the audio. Then he, <laughs> you feel me? He says, you so broke, you got to make up fantasies to cope. Bruh, it's insane. It's insane. Then there's uh, two uh, white gentlemen who seem like normal white guys, but being that they work for Vice, they're probably not normal white guys. I miss normal white guys, frankly. I miss normal white guys. You know, they play sports, baseball, hockey, basketball, football, you know, just normal white guys. <laughs> I, they looked like normal white guys, but they work for Vice, so maybe they're liberal. Then there was the gentleman who had been in communication with my team, uh, whose name is Lyle, and he looks like a white fella from, you know, maybe the Northeast. And then there's uh, a gentleman who goes by the name Vegas, who is actually Norwegian, European, Northern European, that is, um, which is curious to me in as much as he's not an American, you know, doing documentaries on American stuff, you know, getting involved in American culture. And American culture, of course, is, has history, just like any other culture. But I always find it curious that, you know, it's, it's an outsider, you know, reflecting on our history and, you know, explaining our present. So anyways, it seemed like he was the ringleader. I couldn't tell who's the ringleader, whether it's Lyle or Vegas. I really couldn't say. Um, and my team had been mostly interacting with Lyle, I believe, which I also couldn't be certain of. Fortunately, I don't have to deal with those things myself. So anyways, um, they start setting up their stuff and, you know, they're being exceedingly friendly. And I want to discuss this with you all because there are so many lessons here. <laughs> One thing I wrote about in the black box is not thinking that, and for those of you who haven't read it, I highly recommend it. The black box is my book that you can find on Amazon, which is a guide for you. And in there, I explained that though your family may share your blood, that does not necessarily mean that they're going to be, you know, the loving people that you expect. And though someone might share your coloration, you might be alike in skin. That doesn't mean that you're alike in kin. It should mean that doesn't mean you're kin. And so there's a lot of lessons on human nature and how to deal with people. Thank you, Cash Kid. I think many persons will benefit from this. <clears throat> you can type in to Amazon, the black box, Marquette Burton. And just one funny note, these folks are journalists and the gentleman who interviewed me, I did a one-on-one -on -one interview and also they spent two days with us, you know, kind of documenting what I was teaching and also, you know, some of the activities that we engaged in. Uh, so they spent, you know, quite a bit of time, probably about 20 hours, I would say, uh, engaged with us. Um, but the funny thing is during my one-on-one -on -one interview with uh, Vegas, I had um he, he had asked me a number of things tried to make it seem as though he was prepared and well researched um but he had asked me a question i said you haven't read my book the black box 
And he says, oh, no, I haven't. I was like, huh, that, that's quite disappointing. You're, you're a researcher, you're a journalist, and you went to Columbia, a very good school, especially for that particular area of study. So it showed me that maybe there was some kind of uh, hatred there that you couldn't stand to read the book. And as much as if you went to a top university, Berkeley, Johns Hopkins, Columbia, Harvard, Yale, all this stuff, you devour books. You now you take a course and in one course might assign you 10 books. You're taking a full lower load, you might have to read 25 books in a semester, right? So you devour books, especially if you're a journalist. So he said he hadn't read the book and I do believe him because he was asking questions that would indicate that he had not read the book, um, which told me something, you know, and I was getting a lot of data points. And the first thing I already knew is according to the reputation of this company and institution called Vice, Vice News, they're very liberal. <clears throat> and that they do uh, hatchet jobs on people who are not liberal. So having been in business and in corporate, I know that when people are hiring, the hiring manager, you know, the bosses, they want to maintain culture or they want to create a certain culture. And so sometimes they don't own people, or should they don't hire people and they'll say, oh, it's not a culture fit. And what they really mean is that you don't share our values, our ideas. You're not liberal enough. You're not LGBTQ enough, or you're you're not fill in the blank enough. So there's no way, generally speaking, you're going to work for a company and not be like the other persons that are in that company. So if you're working for a liberal company, in all likelihood, you're going to be liberal. And if you're not, at some point, you will be marginalized and shown to the door. Shout to Andre supporting the work rights. Vice is dishonest journalism, evil propaganda. Yes, it appears that way. It is undeniable. And I also acknowledge uh, Ethan. He writes, sometimes you got to put an MF on GoFundMe. <laughs> and I also acknowledge the dude. He writes, peace of the saints. I'm upset I couldn't make it to the book of dark truths. Since I'm a member, I will be able to buy the book when it releases. It is actually not a book in a literal sense. He writes, also, what are your thoughts on the iron? Is that supposed to be iron neck? I'm not familiar with that. Makes your neck strong for boxing, reduce KOs. Um, nah, I, I think people always like to make products to make money, right? Not necessarily because they're good for people. You know, see cigarettes as an example. So I don't think that's necessary, frankly. I think that the chief skills in boxing are uh, having good cardio, having excellent determination, having well-trained defense, and having vicious and you know consistent offense. Um, stopping a KO, well, the best way to stop a KO is to not get hit, which would indicate that either you're leveraging your offense effectively to the other person, they're not able to swim with you, or you have great defense. That's the best way to not get KO'd. You, you get hit in the right place, even if it's not extraordinarily hard, you're going out. I, I am certain that whatever this contraption is, it will not make your neck strong enough that you will not get knocked out. I'm sure Francis Ngannou has a plenty strong neck. He got knocked out viciously. <laughs> Shout out to Marcellus. He writes, peace to the saints, always great for the uh, grateful for the game. I appreciate it. Shout out to Marcellus, whom I had the pleasure of finally meeting in person at the Book of Dark Truth Summit. Also, shout out to the ballers. Sardi's third element writes, normal white guys. That's funny. My pop's family didn't want him to marry my nana because she was Sicilian. Thought she was uh, and her people were low lives. <laughs> this life is certainly tricky. There are no victims. We are all victims by choice. Man, just show up, be kicking game, bruh. Shout out to Charlie. And Charlie, I don't think I met Charlie in person, but it feels like I have. We've done a number of consultations in the past. And one thing that always happens when the Saints get together, they always say this. And it's true, is that you get together with these guys and you feel like you've known them for a long time because the values are shared. And we miss that because often we don't live in communities or neighborhoods where there's people like us. You might be the same color as some of them, but they're different. So shout out to the Saints, you dig, in a real way. You know, it's always a pleasure. It's, you know, as soon as they show up, I, I, my happiness level skyrocket. Shout out to Austin. He writes, okay, oh, where would you say? Let's see. Here you did some work last night, youngster. Oh, 
Okay. Um, no, I wasn't awake at 4 a.m. last night, Brody. So, no, I definitely uh, missed that. Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah, don't trip, bro. Things like that happen. It gets like that, such as life. I'm glad you enjoyed yourself and, you know, I was able to, you know, support that experience. You heard me? And, and shout out to the Saints, man. When you guys come to Saint City, we make sure you live in like bosses. You guys see the view. You know what it is. You know what it's like out here with the big homie. Anyways, carrying on. So um, we get started with the Book of Dark Truths. And before that, we meet the vice staff. And so the, the two white gentlemen that I said look like they're normal white guys, they're a bit standoffish. I actually didn't even get to exchange names with them early on. And then the guy who had came initially and looked into the Sasson HQ and walked away, uh, turns out, as I said, he was from uh, Mexico, lives in Las Vegas, had a very unique haircut. And I chopped it up with him a bit because he was a sound guy. So he mic'd me up and then he says, OK, well, go ahead and talk to me so that we can test the levels. So. You know, I started talking to him like, um, you know, do you like uh, so he asked me, do I like boxing? Because I have a couple I have a belt up and a couple shorts and you know, speed bag, reflex bag, bunch of boxing equipment and Sasson HQ. So he says, do you like boxing? I says, yes, I do. How about you? He says, no, I don't. I said, oh, that's surprising. You know, some a lot of Mexicans like boxing. I was like, what about soccer? You're a soccer guy. He's like, no, I don't like soccer. I was like, oh, OK, well, you probably don't like he was like sports. I was like, yeah. He's like, yeah, I don't like sports. I'm like, okay. Now, what does that tell me? We are radically different kinds of people. First off, I don't believe he doesn't like sports. I'll, I'll explain that in a second. But we're different kinds of people. And we have different values and different culture sets. You know, And he was older than I am. So in the era that he grew up, playing sports is a fundamental. It's a basic for everyone. People weren't really staying inside playing video, ga video games for hours on end. But he was a fairly small gentleman. And often we think that we've made a conscious decision when really we've reacted to something. We made a reaction. You hear me? So, you know, he's small and slim and probably not very strong, not very fast. So as a result, he can't excel really in many sports outside of being a horse race jockey. And that's not a common sport people play. So then he comes to the conclusion he doesn't like sports. And really the actual answer is I'm not good at sports. And as a result, he doesn't have a number of experiences that you get from sports, you know, learning about hierarchy, learning about, you know, how males engage with one another and how ruthless it can be in sports. Um, so I knew we had a different value set. His value set, probably more liberal, like those of vice. And these are the conversations you have to assess people. So then I started the Book of Dark Truth Summit, just focused solely on the saints and people just kept showing up. Now, we actually had a packed house. I had to have my assistant drive to my home uh, and bring chairs from my home down to Sasson HQ because we had more people there than it was expected. Obviously, we had the vice crew. They came up with like five people. And then we had more saints than I even expected, frankly. And so we had a packed house. We had a great time. We're, we're getting into the Book of Dark Truths. Of course, this is some wild stuff. And I know that media, they're looking for a viral moment. That's all there is to it. And this is not a new concept, looking for virality. You know, 30, 40 years ago, they also wanted virality. So I was like, okay, I can give you that. No problem. Because one thing I know is that the crazier thing you say, the more likely it is to be reprinted, replayed, retweeted, etc. And then those who are actually curious persons, generally those of higher IQ, they will do research. Oh, who is this guy that said that? And then once they do research and they can dig into the catalog, they can find, ah, oh, this is a very reasonable man who's very sincere and is making great efforts to organize in the community and supporting the causes that he says uh, that he says he believes in and also working against the things that he says he reviles and are bad for society. And so I said, okay, I'll give you guys a couple of viral moments. I say a number of wild things that are true, but just in harsh terms. And so they film from uh, initially from maybe about 11 AM to 4 PM noon, at which point there's a lunch break during the, uh, but before they had started filming, I had, you know, taken a stroll with my captain. We had some conversation about, you know, the situation and, you know, our strategic moves to be made. 
And one thing that we had asked Vice when we got back there, a number of things, actually, we, we asked Vice, hey, um, will you send us any of the clips or any of the raw footage? They say, no, we won't send any raw footage. We won't share any raw footage or any clips. Okay. Um, will you submit um, your final project or, or submit the clips that you want to put in the final project for approval? They say, no. I say, can we have veto on any of the clips? If there's a clip you want to use, we say, hey, we, we don't want that clip or to be portrayed in that way. Um, can we engage that? He says, well, you know, like we try to be fair and honest and, you know, we don't want to misrepresent anyone. You know, we're not here to, you know, portray any particular thing. We're just reporting on masculinity. So, you know, we might be able to do that. I can ask, like, if we can get you guys any footage, I'll ask our editing team and We'll ask if there's, you know, we, we want you to be happy with the outcome. Okay. Then I said, how long do you want to film? They said, well, we want to film everything. We want to film the whole day. So from uh, basically 12 p.m. and we uh, all the way through. So, you know, 12 p.m. to 9, 10 p.m. Okay, cool. Fantastic. So they're going to do about 10, 11 hours of filming. All right. So we go from the start of the, con or they arrive early and then they're filming from about 11 a.m. Um, we take a lunch break at 4 p.m. As I said, I'm an introvert, so everyone went to lunch uh, together at, at a, a nearby place close to Assassin headquarters, which is why I wanted to have Assassin HQ in a place where there's like commercial things around. I've been hosting the previous conferences at my home, which is in a gated community. And as a result, there's you know just houses around, so we'd always cater. So anyways, um, I go upstairs um, in Sassen HQ and, you know, take my meal by myself. Everyone else goes to, um, a nearby area where there's like a lot of food vendors. And, um, I go downstairs and ask Vi and, and one of the vice guys says, Hey, um, what are you going to be doing in the second half of the day uh, before you guys, you know, go out socially? I say basically the same thing. I'm you know, going through knowledge. That's about it. And he says, OK, well, we're, we're going to pack up and we'll come back when you guys are about to transition into the social part of the evening. I say, OK, fantastic. I observed them uh, start to gather their things, which were quite a few. And I heard the leader, Vegas, tell them, yeah, take everything. Because one of the guys asked, well, do we take everything? Because we're going to come back tomorrow and shoot. We're also going to come back later tonight, but we're going to be mobile. We're going to have a mobile team. So anyways, he says, no, take everything, take everything. We'll just come back and set it, set it back up. So then they um, seem to take everything and leave. I go back upstairs. I, uh, you know, finish my meal, come back downstairs and uh, start getting everything going. And I noticed there was a, a, a brown rucksack that was left in the rear, kind of in, 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 in a discreet location. And, and my first thought was, I, I bet that's maybe one of the vice guys belongings. But as I said, we had a pack house with many of the saints. So you know, it, it could have been, could have been anyone. So we couldn't be certain. One thing they did do when that first came is that they had put in some hidden mics uh, so that they could get good audio, not only from me, but also from you know, the people responding to things I was saying, asking questions, engaging the content. So we knew that there were some hidden mics put around SAS and HQ, which supposedly were all swept up when they were leaving. And of course, they had a whole video team. Now, cameras are a touch harder to hide, especially if you want quality footage. And there's no need to stream out any footage. You can just have the camera, be it a video camera or a voice camera, record. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be big. But you know, the idea of having, having a hidden camera would be harder just from a positioning standpoint. But having a you know, hidden voice record, uh, audio recorder, very easy. So I looked at that. And I was like, huh, that's very strange. I don't think that that's one of ours. I think it's one of theirs. And that's one thing that we're adding into our um, security protocol in terms of bag management for persons who come on to any of our locations. So do remind me of that. I'll discuss that with my captain. We'll reincorporate that into boot camp. And I am also going to um, update the boot camp materials generally. And we're going to make sure that we can get that information redisseminated uh, because we want everyone to be on point, on the same page. Anyways, so guys get back from lunch. We resume with um, the Book of Dark Truth Summit. And the first thing I tell them is, 
uh, folks, I want you all to know that I am quite certain that Vice has left a um, recording device here. I wouldn't put it past them. Um, so just be aware, mind your manners. I, I trust that we are being recorded and uh, there you go. So anyways, I was planning on saying some wild shit regardless, whether they were recording covertly or not. I think in their mind, uh, there's the idea that, you know, we're not going to loosen up and say what's real because they're there. I am already aware of what kind of persecution someone in my position will have to deal with. And I'm fine with that. The persecution has already started before this. So I was, I'm going to say what I'm going to say. And unlike some persons in the manosphere or the online space, when I first started, I came in, I always said my name, Marquette Devon Burton, the Saint, the center. I said my true name. I didn't hide behind a fake name or a stage name like most of the internet. And the reason why is because I've never committed a heinous crime. I've never done something despicable. I have a clean name and a strong reputation from living an upright life my whole life. And anything that I've done that was, you know, shysty or criminal, you can read about in the black box. And when I've been wrong, I've conceded that. And in no case have I been deeply immorally wrong. You know, I've made some, you know, done hood things in the ghetto, um, but you know, nothing crazy, nothing heinous. And that's why I've always been proud to say my true name. So anyways, I say that to say this, um, unlike some individuals in the, uh, this sphere, there's no way to like vilify me with facts, with the truth. You can only make up things. And there's no court case that can be brought against me because I've not done anything uh, despicable like some individuals. Uh, shout out to Kay, um, supporting the work via Cash App. Writes for, okay, got you. And he sends in his question using the email below along with his Cash App. He writes, uh, for Warquette Burton, shout out to the book that people pass around that talks about that one group that they should never date. Number two, shout out to all those who soaked up some important information, indeed, invested in themselves, smart men, men who love themselves. Number three, avoid baby traps. Yes, indeed. And you know what? I actually talked about that at, at length during uh, the Book of Dark Truth Summit because family is important, but you have to design you know, and one thing I do want to note, not because uh, I consider Fresh a friend and colleague, but because some people just can't understand things because it's not their life. For example, if you're dealing with a lot of women and you end up getting accused of something, that shouldn't be surprising because females often are not accountable. So the higher number of women you deal with, the more likely you're, you are to get accused of something. Like, for example, my lip is swollen. Why? Because I'm often fighting in boxing. The more often you're boxing you're more likely to end up with a bloody nose or a swollen lip or a chipped tooth. That's the game you're in. You're, you're getting a higher number of punches swung at you. You're going to get hit sometimes. You're involved in a dangerous or dirty game. You're going to get hit or some filth is going to get on you. So what I'm saying is not that his choice of women was good. It was atrocious. Um, but, you know, when you're poking all these chicks, you know, at some point you're going to get caught slipping. I say that to say we're all human, and though I think it was a terrible decision, my heart goes out to him, terrible circumstance, you all shouldn't be surprised that this happened, but also you shouldn't be you know, casting stones as though he's an imbecile. He's not an imbecile. He's just a, a man who made a mistake. That's just all there is. He's a man who made a mistake. And unfortunately, some of you watching may make the same mistake. That doesn't make you dumb. That makes you a man who made a mistake. I just want people to be reasonable. That, that's all I'm encouraging is reason. Now, I know encouraging reason to get you killed. I think historically there have been a number of persons who were reasonable. It didn't work out very well. You know, Socrates, Copernicus, others. Anyways, carrying on. May I acknowledge Black Flag supporting the work. Also, shout out to GB writes, Peace of the Saints. How could I approach working with a 20-year-old man who is extremely shy and lacks confidence and social skills, such as looking another man in the eye when speaking? How could I help get him out of his shell? Well, GB, we have a three-sentence Bible. Number one, be yourself. Number two, be good to yourself. Number three, be good to good people. So my first question for you would be, what is the benefit for you? And that could be you know, making him better so that he achieves better results at work because he works under you or, you know, 
fill in the blank. If there's a benefit from you, for you, then yeah, I'd say pursue it. If there's no benefit for you, I'd say I might not want to get involved in that. All of your capitals are precious, your capital of time, emotion, uh, reputation, money, etc. So that would be my first question is why? And then the second piece, yeah, I, I'm going to stick with that first one. Why? Carrying on. Now, back to uh, the vice situation. So as I said, when we come back for the second half of the Book of Dark Truth Summit on the first day, Friday, uh, April 5th, we had uh, the room was bugged, no doubt. And then I let the saints know that the room was bugged. And curiously, once the uh, sessions, the lecture portions or really discussion portions ended and it was time to transition into the social aspect, Vice reappeared uh, just, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes early before the transitioning to the social aspect. And I was informed by one of the saints and shout out to the saint because he's a very sharp gentleman. He said, hey, Marquette, you told us it was bugged and they supposedly had cleaned out all of their supplies and belongings when... Uh, they came back. So-and-so went straight to that rucksack. He went straight to that rucksack. Um, so I was like, huh, okay, curious. And it was a large enough rucksack, and it was positioned where they were. It was not something you could have forgotten on accident. I told the saying, uh, another saying, I said, hey, keep an eye out. Look at that rucksack and, and let me know if any materials, be the technology for audio, video recording or otherwise, comes out of that rucksack that they use to record us as we engage uh, one of our, you know, uh, the social aspect. He says, okay, I'll keep an eye out. So he notices that uh, Vegas takes that rucksack and basically takes it back to the car. And the other guys come and they have the audio video equipment. And then we leave Sasson headquarters and start uh, going to the Fremont experience because it was the first Friday in Vegas. So the arts district has a, a thing. A lot of people uh, are out and about. And so we're just mobbing through um, and they're, you know, recording us using a boom mic, a couple cameras. So that rucksack did not have anything that was used for that mobile um, videography experience. So that rucksack was being used for something else. And I surmise that's where they had um, their audio recording uh, equipment. Anyways. Um, so we're strolling through and they uh, interview a number of the saints, you know, asking them, you know, fairly basic questions to start with, you know, hey, why does Marquette's message resonate with you? Um, why do you follow? Why'd you show up here? Why do you think there's a need for masculine content? Things like that. So, sorry, I got a note. So he was asking the saints, things like that. And there's a number of folks who um, opted into being interviewed. And I don't know what they said, because honestly, I wasn't there to you know, engage with Vice. I was there to run a summit and also, more importantly, to engage with the saints who were there and you know, get to know them. Because as much as they're interested in knowing me, I'm very interested in knowing them. So I was having conversation with various saints and just trying to you know, meet as many of the guys and learn as much about them as possible. So I was actually quite happy that I didn't have to talk to Vice. Um, so we're walking along, they're interviewing some of the guys. Those are some of the questions that they asked uh, different saints. You know, why don't you listen to other people? Who don't you listen to? You know, why is Marquette the best? Um, why is masculine content necessary? What value do you get from this? And then they start asking more dark leading questions. Well, you know, do you think that women should be controlled? You know, Marquette says that, you know, women are like this and like that. And, you know, saying like, whoa, actually, he doesn't say that. Where'd you get that from? And so it becomes a bit um, contentious, you know, by design. It seems as though they're trying to uh, push people into false dichotomies. Um, may I also acknowledge uh, one of the saints? Shout out to David. Just be got, He just got the Master Communicator course. You're going to love it. I promise you. Um, and do drop the link for the Master Communicator course for those who would like to become great at communicating, both interpersonally as well as public speaking, knowing not only how to conduct yourself with friends, socially, with women, but even in the workplace, you'll all find it to be a great benefit. So anyways, we're walking through. They're asking the guys a bunch of questions. Eventually, we end up like maneuvering through crowds. And I guess they said, OK, these guys don't give an F that we're here. They're walking fast. They're going through big crowds. We'll give it up for today. So then that was the end of it. One thing I do want to note is that during the first day, during that first uh, four hour 
bit where I was lecturing and engaging uh, the saints in conversation and dialogue during the summit. One thing that I'm re that's really important to me, and you got to remember, I'm one of the few people on YouTube who's teaching because that's what people are doing on YouTube. They're, they're lecturing, they're teaching. I'm one of the very few who, A, was actually formally trained to be a teacher. I have education in teaching, and I've also, I'm probably the only person who's been paid to teach at the tertiary level, at the university uh, level, at the postdoc level, uh, at the grad school level. I'm the only one. So I've had checks cut by uh, many schools, including Ivy League schools, MBA programs, et cetera, to have me come in and teach and lecture. So obviously I know how to teach. I have the, um, the skills and the knowledge that is paid for at the high level. And of course I uh, was schooled in pedagogy. So I, I know how to engage people and I want to. I want you to understand the why. I want you to truly comprehend. So as we're going through, I'm always querying people and asking them, well, what do you think of this? What's wrong with this? What's right with this? Hey, here's a graph. Interpret this. Hey, here's a chart. Explain this. What do you think this means? I'm not there to dictate. I'm there to make you think. Okay? So engaging people is core for me because you're going to remember what the chart means better if before I say anything about it, I say, hey, take a look at that. Study that for a couple minutes. Okay, great. What do you think that means? Why does it mean that? Why is it right? What might be wrong? What's confusing about it? So at one point, I show a, a, a graph that was fairly obvious as to what it means. So the graph goes up. It speaks about male and female biological realities and how the human female and the human male break down over time and why. At one point, I say to um, Vegas, I said, hey, this chart, can you explain to me why these lines are trending in the way that they're trending and what they might mean? He says, no, I can't explain that. I said, oh, why is that? He says, well, it's not true. I said, oh, it's not true at all. It's not true at any per I was like, what percentage of truth might be involved in this chart in my explanation? He says, 0%. I said, okay, so it's 0% true. He says, that's right. I was like, so it makes no sense whatsoever. You don't understand anything about it. He says, that's right. And then at that point, it was a great teachable moment. So I turned to all the saints and I say, see, this is what I was actually talking about earlier because we were discussing lies, which are used strategically in the society. We went really deep about lies. In fact, for two days, we talked about lies, the structure of them, who manufactures them, how you can utilize them. It, it was really interesting stuff. How to lie effectively, why you shouldn't lie. Very deep stuff we got into in the Book of Dark Truths. But I said, see, see? I said, this individual right here represents someone who is unreasonable. I asked him to reason, which means think, and he refused to reason. How do we know that he's being unreasonable? If we take the basics of the fact that I'm not an idiot and he's not an idiot, right? We both went to elite universities, both of us. And I asked him to tell me if anything on this chart makes sense. And he said, it makes sense 0%. So if it makes sense 0%, that would mean I basically picked up a handful of boo-boo and rubbed it onto the board. And I'm pointing to you a, a whole screen filled with boo-boo, no value, nonsensical. Now, being that I'm, a, I'm not a madman, I'm not an imbecile, it's improbable that I could write out something that is completely idiotic. <laughs> it's impossible. Even if I were in Vegas' seat and he were up at the board explaining some tenets of liberal thinking and ideology, and he turned to me and said, Marquette, what makes sense about this? I can tell him at some level, I'm, I don't agree, but I surmise that your logic was, or I surmise that the rationale behind this chart is, or I don't agree, but I think that. So if he says, like, Mark, what, what are the merits of the LGBTQ movement? I might say, I don't agree with the movement in its form today, but some of the merits are that these people do not want to be victim of violence that roots from hatred and prejudice. Yes, I can acknowledge that. I can acknowledge that your side has some merits and some points. 
but he was not willing to acknowledge that my side had some merits and some points, which was another reminder. These people are not our friends. In fact, they are outright enemies. And it's funny because when they first showed up, they were all smiles and, hey, we're objective. We're just the news. We're the media. We report. We don't create opinion. We're not propagandists. We're not liars. We're not trying to smear you. We're not trying to paint a picture. Well, how could that be? When I asked you a question and you told me that what you're seeing is completely ludicrous and unreasonable, that doesn't sound objective. It doesn't even sound like you're willing to think. It sounds like you're choosing blindness. And in this case, blindness to the truth. And so I knew, and I told the saints, I say, hey, these guys are very friendly, but they're crafty. And sometimes killers come with smiles. And that is precisely why the book of dark truths is so darn important. Because the book of dark truths tells you what the really, what the reality is, the harsh reality, the ugly reality of things, of human nature, of this world that we're in, so that you can operate effect, effectively and win. Because there are some things that people out there know and they're using and you don't know. There's some strategies that they're utilizing and you're not aware of. Hmm? So anyways, I say that to say this. He dug in on his liberal position. He dug in on taking a blindness to anything that was outside of his liberal matrix of thought. Ironically, the next day, they were coming in to do a one-on-one -on -one interview with me, right? So they're going to interview the saint in the center for a couple hours, one-on-one, -on -one, Barbara Walters, uh, 60 minutes, Charlie Rose type situation. So, um, and mind you, I just want to give you guys a side note on life. Seize opportunities. Go forward like a fearless lunatic. Don't ever be scared. Sometimes you don't get to eat. Sometimes you don't get to sleep. Keep going. As I mentioned, I've only been sick two times in my life from a man-made disease that was made by the wicked governments of the earth in you know, collaboration of the United States government and the Chinese government. Recovering still from that illness I'm experiencing, you know, fatigue, shortness of breath, and like a lot of these symptoms that you can see on Google. So suffering, not in good health, and, you know, jet lagged from coming from across the world and still running multiple businesses, which I'm telling you I'm planning on stopping soon. There's just one more tech, tech business that I really think is going to do well. So we're pushing it through. But after that, I'm going to stop. I promise you. It's too much work, too much time. Anyway, so I'm working around the clock and then I got the summit I'm putting on. And then, of course, I want to give everyone, you know, there's what you pay for is the summit, you know, which is noon to 9 p.m. That's that's what you paid for. But what I always want to do is go above and beyond. And more importantly, because I love my people, I want to know them. I want to understand them. I want to encourage them. I want to value them. I want this to feel like family. After all of our events, I always take the guys out. I always spend some social time just to chop it up, hear them talk. You know, I. I don't like to talk for all those hours, but that's what people came for. I get to hear them talk afterwards. So, you know, I go out, you know, and finish hanging out with the guys late at night and uh, end up getting back to my my home probably at about a little after 12 a.m. Knock out for an hour and a half. You know, I'm up and, you know, working by 2.30 a.m. because I got to meet with my tech folks on, on my tech business. So I got a guy on the team on the East Coast, uh, got some other guys around the world. We're dealing with that. And then I got to get back to Sassin HQ because these guys want to come in at 7 a.m. to interview me, uh, do our one-on-one. -on -one. And we're going to go live again on, or start back again at noon for the Book of Dark Truth Summit. So they want to get in you know, up to four hours of interview. They got to come in early to set up the interview environment. And they want to do that at 7 a.m. So basically, I got like an hour and a half of sleep. And um, I do a four hour one on one interview, of course, where he's trying to get gotcha moments and try to trick me, try to misrepresent me. I'm doing this on an hour and a half of sleep. And I say that not to say I would have done it differently because you can't do it differently. The only way you could do it differently is by not taking the opportunity. There was no way to get eight hours of sleep and for me to uh, do all of the things that I want to do. Exercise every day maintain my business affairs, meet my obligations, keep my word. That's Marquette Devon Burton. And if that requires me not to sleep or eat for X amount of time, that's what it is. And that's how life is sometimes. And as a man, that's what you have to deal with. Maybe as a woman and a child, you don't have to deal with that. 
you know, as a child, you, you get to sleep in as a woman, you let somebody else take care of you. But as a man, that's what it gets to every now and then. You do not complain. You execute. Huh? You execute. And here's the thing. On an hour and a half of sleep, I'm sharper than most people on eight hours of sleep. You dig? Would I be sharper if I had the full four hours that I normally get? For sure, I would have been sharper. But at the end of the day, sometimes you cannot get that. It just is what it is. What are you going to do? Miss an opportunity? What are you going to do? Not be as successful? Go hard. Take the opportunities. Take the risk. Jump off the cliff. See what's down there. So I just want to encourage all of you men to do that and also to know that life is not going to always be easy. And just because you have a, you know, you might be financially successful or popular or famous or whatever the case may be, that doesn't mean life becomes easy. And you also don't stop pursuing. You, you keep working towards your goals. Anyways, so on an hour and a half of sleep, they come in, they set up. We do the one-on-one -on -one, uh, interview. And there are a couple uh, you know, curious and comical points during the one-on-one -on -one interview. The only thing that I actually, there are only like really three points of the interview that I did not like, uh, which meaning from my performance, you cannot control what they're going to say and do. You can control what you say and do. I was unimpressed with my introduction because I'm being interviewed about masculine content. So when you say, well, who are you? I always feel inclined to go into my business background because when I'm usually a paid speaker or I'm being interviewed, I'm being interviewed about things related to tech or business or, you know, fill in the blank. And so I was almost at a loss of like, well, what is there to say? I don't like go into my business pedigree, my education. Um, so my introduction was unimpressive to me. And then um, there were some other answers I didn't feel were very sharp and you know, well expressed. Now, I was talking to my assistant and she was saying that she's like, yeah, I'm sure you did way better than you think you did, which I think what she really means is that I have high standards. So what I'm not impressed with is usually above average to most people. I think that's what she means. But anyways, during the interview, Ali, uh, or me, Vegas, he one said a number of strange things. You could tell he was trying to either irritate me or trying to get me angry or trying to get me emotional or off center or just trying to be just blatantly insulting. And it didn't work, obviously. <laughs> I'm an easygoing person. And I, I, I know that he's coming for me. Uh, during the interview, he says, oh, you have a three sentence Bible. And so I say, well, you know, we use that as a metaphor, right? Obviously, it doesn't compare to the Bible or any other, you know, major religious work. But we would say three cents Bible, three cents Quran, three cents Torah, which is just to say, you know, three cents of guidance and goodness. And it goes like this. And then he says, oh, OK, you know what that sounds like? I say, what does it sound like? I couldn't think of anything it would sound like in as much as there's nothing like it. And I didn't model it on anything. I created it from scratch with no inspiration from anything on earth. So what could it sound like is what I'm thinking in my head. But I say, well, what does it sound like? And he says, well, it sounds like the satanic Bible. I'm like, here we go again. Here we go again. The satanic Bible, Brody, or the satanic Bible. I was like, oh, okay, well, what, what is that? And frankly, I've never heard of the satanic Bible, which sounds like a contradiction in terms. You would think uh, Bible is like a positive God-related thing, and satanic seems like the opposite. And so anyways, um, he says, yeah, well, the Satanic Bible is written by so-and-so, and it's about this and means this. And I was in my head, I was like, why do you even know that? Like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, well, no, it has nothing to do with that. And I've never heard of that. So then we uh, carry on with the conversation. His Lyle was on the side thinking of questions, which I, I thought was curious in as much as I didn't know who the boss was. I was like, is Lyle the boss? Seems like he's thinking of the questions. Or is he just like more clever or more informed? Is he the guy who actually read the black box? And then we come to another point when Ali Urshimi Vegas. Why do I keep wanting to say Ali? There's a rapper back in the day named Ali Vegas. But uh, Vegas says to me, he says, do you think we could be friends? I say, no, absolutely not. And I, I was glad that he asked me that question. And I hope that he can, um, I hope that makes it into the uh, the final cut because I think it's a major lesson for people. He says, well, why can't we be friends? I say, well, number one, we don't share values, but what's more important than that is you're not a reasonable person. And I'd only be friends with a reasonable person. You see those who are unreason unreasonable, which is to say they're 100% certain of their truth, 
which is to suggest that they're 100% correct and others are 0% correct, also known as 100% wrong, those are people who are uncompromising, dangerous personalities. You might observe this in dictators, and that is why they tend to be violent and murderous because they, they value the other person's thinking, they value the other person's humanity, they value the other person's position at such a low level, it's okay to kill them because they don't matter. It's okay to kill them because they're imbeciles. And that is the mentality you displayed yesterday when I asked you a simple question and you suggested that I'd rubbed boo-boo on the wall instead of creating something that could make sense in some realm. You made it seem as though it was just impossible, which showed me that you're not one who's willing to think. You're one who has made judgments and you feel some strange godly level of certainty. So no, we can never be friends. You're not a reasonable person. I think you're in fact a dangerous person and personality. Then he says, oh no, actually, you know, I was thinking about it. And, you know, like there is some things about what you said that made sense, you know, especially like, you know, the biological things that you broke down and, and this and that. He was like, so what do you think now? Could we be friends? I was like, well, first of all, I don't think that you want to be my friend. And I certainly don't want to be your friend. That's been clear since the beginning of our engagement. But more importantly, someone like you, what you do is not, now I've seen it before. In fact, I've met persons like you many times. You are someone of high intelligence, certainly not a good person, but you have high intelligence. And what intelligent people learn over time is you learn how to represent yourself in ways that are more palatable to others. So being that you're in a room full of people who are reasonable but are uh, and don't share your values, when you said what you said, you notice that you kind of offended everyone in here. And you notice that you know you weren't in popular opinion within this closed environment. And you notice when I, I called you out, you started lying immediately. This is something I actually left out. So I called him out on day one and he said, oh, well, no, I'm just saying I don't understand. I, I said, I don't understand. I was like, you didn't say that. He basically lied and claimed that he said he didn't comprehend which he had never said. And everyone was like, whoa, bro, you didn't say that. You're lying. So during the one-on-one -on -one interview, uh, Vegas was, I was basically, you know, reading him the riot act, if you will, just exposing him to his face and saying, you know, right now what you're doing is saying that you thought about what I said and now you realize that what I said does have some map, some merit and some value. But all you're doing because you're intelligent is you're saying, oh, well, when I was completely unreasonable, when I was being extremely radical and liberal, everyone rejected me. So now I'm going to reformulate my opinion. I'm going to make it more moderate. I'm going to concede some ground so I'm not perceived as the radical that I am. So that's what intelligent people do. We say, OK, well, they treated me like this when I wore that haircut. So I'm going to wear a different haircut so people accept me or treat me differently. You use your intelligence to represent yourself differently. Stupid people are too dumb to know how to change their image and change the way they're perceived. Highly intelligent people can manipulate their image, manipulate their manner of speech, their colloquialisms, the way they engage people. They even try to act nice when they know they don't like someone. Intelligent people are crafty. I was like, so Vegas, you're just being crafty so that you can like kind of ingratiate yourself or feel accepted in the environment or just look reasonable. And I see through it from a mile of way and I'm not going to reassess who you are because I rightly assessed you the first time. I rightly assessed you and I'm not going to allow you to like try to, you know, sell me a dream now. Now I acknowledge the folks who have supported the work. Shout out to. OK, GB writes, he's a young man in my church. His mom asked me to talk to him. He doesn't have a male figure in his life. OK, that's, that's some important context. So number one, they're at your church and his mother's reached out to you. So congratulations to you. That speaks well of your character, number one. Number two, the church theoretically should have a lot of good people in it. And he's a young man. So I think you should take a serious hand at this and be straightforward with him. But know that being that he was raised with a female and has already displays many characteristics of lack of confidence and weakness, he might be at some level intimidated by you, your manliness, masculinity, and directness. But that's okay. Stay persistent with him. So obviously the true issues that the young man is having are deeper than the behaviors he displays. 
But the simple thing is to start with the behaviors. And what you do is you train people. You train a football player. You train a, a, a soldier. It's training that impacts the way we operate and behave. So the first thing when you say extremely shy, well, what are the behaviors? Write them down. Have him write those behaviors down. Is his voice not high enough or loud enough when he speaks? Is his handshake not firm enough when he greets someone? Write all those things down. Write down what should be done and then practice it with him. Those are great starting points for the basics. The second piece, um, if you get to it, is then to start asking him about you know, his experiences and his thinking about himself. How do you feel about yourself? Where do you think your shyness comes from? Do you feel intimidated by others? How do you perceive them? That That's the the second part that you'll get into. And I, I commend you for this contribution you're making. Shout out to Jacoby. He writes, peace of Saints tuition to the big homie. The game is mindset changing. Please carry on, sir. Yes, sir. May I also acknowledge Nico. I appreciate you. Okay. Mindset changing for some people, I see. <laughs> Thank you to those who have supported the work. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And may I also acknowledge Dorian, who produces his hat, which you can get at mdblabel.com. And I always want to support the Saints. And he was also at the uh, Book of Dark Truth Summit. It's always a pleasure to see him and his brother. Uh, they also shot a fade here, uh, you know, sparred uh, during the uh, summit. It was phenomenal. It was a great session. Very impressed at the gym. And, and they stay very dripped out. Great style those young men have. But you can support him by purchasing this hat at mdblabel.com. You can get this shirt at manandwomanbrand.com. Yiddy. And Man and Woman Brand, for those of you who might be new to me, is a brand that represents us. Because there are many who you know represent the... <laughs> the flag of sexual deviance, and there are very few who represent the natural pairing of man and woman. I invite you to do so. Shout out to Cade supporting. He writes extra super chat for the email. Okay, very good. And shout out to Adrian. He writes message in the chat. If you'd be kind enough to send a message to that email address below, that would be helpful. Uh, Adrian, I appreciate you. Carrying on. Now, so... We complete the one-on-one -on -one interview after much contention. There are a couple times I had to turn up on them. Uh, tell me how funny you think this is. We're talking about young men. Now, mind you, when you track through my life, you'll see I, I know young men well, pause, in as much as I've always been in sports. I worked at an after-school program with children. I went into teaching after, oh, I, I ran a, uh, founded a fraternity at university, a very successful one, which still exists, second largest fraternity at Berkeley. I founded a nonprofit after uh, university, excuse me, after teaching for young men. I also taught young men as a teacher in Baltimore City. Um, it goes on and on. I know young men, I've put on events for young men over the years. So I'm sitting across from a guy who's older than me but is a reporter, which means an observer of life, not a doer, but the observer, the, the recorder, the secretary of human events. And he's telling me what young men want. And I say, no, sir, you are lying. That is incorrect. You are wildly out of touch. He said that to young men, it is more important to have health care than it is to have a Lambo. I said, sir, you are completely insane. Truly insane. Like, I can't even believe you said that out loud. He said that young men would rather have health insurance than a Lambo. I said, Brody, that's crazy as hell. So long story short, we had to, you know, I had to go in on him for that one because I was ludicrous. I mean, can, could you imagine saying something like that? <laughs> a 22-year-old male would rather have health insurance than a Lambo? Stop it. All day, stop it. Shout to Lid Jimmy. Le Jimmy, Le Jimmy, boy. He writes, I have an insane chick who is obsessed with me that thinks I might, that I think might do something vindictive to me if I break things off, like making false allegations. How do I get rid of her without potentially, without her retaliating? Yes, I've been experienced this as well. What I would do is number one, communicate using evidence-based forms. Generally with women, you want to communicate using non-evidence-based forms. But there's a couple of pieces of evidence you want to establish before you ghost her. And I think ghosting her will be the better way to do it as opposed to breaking up with her. 
So what you want to do is to communicate with her on an evidence-based form and clearly establish in whatever language and however, you know, you be intelligent about it, establish that you've always had consensual experiences. You've never done anything wrong to her. You've never laid a hand on her out of anger. You've never hit her or anything like that. And every time you guys had any physical, you know, sexual relation, it was welcomed and something she enjoyed. Once you have that on an evidence-based form of communication, obviously clip that evidence, hold on to it for safekeeping. I love these things over email. You probably don't email the girl, so you'll have to screenshot text messages and send it to yourself on email, make the appropriate subject line so you can pull this back up if it ever you know, becomes necessary. Then I would ghost her. And in addition to ghosting her, if she's ever like pulled any like stalker type activities, I'd be very quick to uh, go ahead and you know bring the police into this. Unfortunately, in as much as you need documentation, shout to Melvin supporting the work, right? Standing up and supporting love and respect. I appreciate you. Um, so yeah, I'd I'd call those coppers in so that you can get your paperwork in order first because you know big government is something that women love in these or let me say liberal and psychotic women they love and will use on you big government alimony child support police um false claims of domestic violence etc so that's my advice for you and i'm wishing you um you know much peace as you deal with this it gets like that now acknowledge adrian he writes peace to the saints like peace to the saints uh, where may I go to schedule a consultation with Mark Pfeiffer? Forgive me if I misspelled his name, bro. Uh, man, his name is extremely hard to spell, bro. I certainly forgive you. He writes, I couldn't find it on sassin.com. Thank you. Very good question. I forget how much his consultation is. I think it's $350. Um, so you can send it to me and I will connect you with him via email. So you just cash at me $350 with your email address and just... If you if there's enough space, no consultation, Mark. Um, but otherwise, I'll just uh, connect you to via email, and then you guys can schedule and execute. Thank you for that. And, and Mark is good. He's great with Amazon and as well um, real estate. Phenomenal in those areas. Truly, I acknowledge Isaiah. He writes, "Victory is already ours." Indeed, sir. Oh, and the funny thing too that really struck me about uh, Vegas when I first encountered him, the first thing he said to me was like, you, "You like to box? I want you to, you know, like I want you to fight me. I want to box you." And I was just like in my head, I was like, "That's so strange." Frankly, I don't like when people come at me like that. I don't care if they're a boxer, if they're an MMA guy, if they're a saint, if who they are. I don't like the idea of people asking to fight me. I it, it's tacky. It's weird. It, it's annoying. I perceive it as a microaggression and it, it does not bring any positive or good feelings. And if I respect someone and like someone, I, I really don't want to fight them. I don't want to hurt them. You'll observe with the saints, you will never see me hit anyone hard ever. And if I do hit someone hard, it's only because I threw a punch with proper form and didn't pull it as much as I should, or I didn't pull it as, you know, at the distance but you'll never see me hit one of the saints hard or even try to hit any of them hard. You know, I'm, I'm enjoying it. You know, we're, we're working, you know, I'm letting them get off shots. I'm not trying to hit anybody hard. I've never once in my head said, I'm going to go hard. There've been times I've gotten a little bit loose once, you know, my body's warmed up, my reflexes speed up a bit, but I've never tried to hit anyone hard. That's not my nature. I don't even really want to spar or box people. I know. So anyways, he's like, yeah, I want to box you. I want to fight you. And I was like, do, do you though? And I'm like, actually, you really don't want that at all. That's probably like the thing that you want the least. Like, you don't want that at all. And so in my head, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to spar this guy. I let one of my young boys touch him up. You heard me? I let one of these 19, 20 year olds, 21 year olds, you know, you know, touch him up a little bit. So anyways, um, as I say, I like to over deliver with everything that I do. So at the end of the second uh, day of the True, uh, Book of Dark Truth Summit, which was epic, man, second day was epic, bro. We, we were really cooking the second day. And what I love, and because I'm not into myself, like a lot of people, are, they're true narcissists. They think they always have to be talking. They think they have to be the center of attention. They think everything has to be about them. During my conferences or my summits or my in-person events, if one of the saints has something intelligent to add to the conversation, I want to listen. I want to be enriched. I want to learn something. I also want the saints to be able to hear from each other. 
You, I don't have to be talking constantly. And so I yield the floor happily and I yield the floor a lot. And we had a lot of good game in there. <laughs> I'm telling you, we had some we had some saints in there that were really cooking. And so the second day was great because we were, were really you know loose and we had great content, excellent topics. And we had experienced men in the building and, and we were all chefing up together, man. Great information. And so anyways, um, day two closed and it was just a really beautiful, special way that it closed. Uh, we had a lot of closing words from folks. We, we darkened the assassin headquarters and we, we have a spotlight that shoots down from the second floor. And so we put the spotlight on. It was just a really powerful experience. And so we closed out uh, day two which was the end of the conference or excuse me, end of the summit. And then we go to the parking lot to get in some, some boxing, real grimy gutter, um, gritty environment, which I like, I like it a lot. Um, so we're, we go there to get in a little bit of boxing and, and sure enough, this Vegas fella is, I want to box. I want to do this. And I'm just, as I said, my priority is the saints. And so we're going through our, uh, routines, our exercise, our warm up routines, our exercise routines, and then uh, our warm up specifically for sparring. And then he said he wanted to box, and you know some of the Saints were working with him and you know teaching him his fundamentals, which you know hey he may have already boxed before. And then, you know, Chris had told me a couple of times he's like, you know, I want him. I was like, okay, for sure, I I'll let you warm him up. And then I was going to hand him off to one of the young boys, you hear me? So, Chris, you know. Chris gloves up and we we put some headgear on uh, Vegas and I tell Chris, like, you know, don't, don't hit him in the head, you know, just give him some body shots. And um, we put Vegas in there and I said, hey, do you know how long three minutes is? And he says, yes, I do. I said, OK, well, you're going to find out how long three minutes actually is. You know, it's one of the early lessons in boxing is you really value time. You value time. You understand how long a minute is, three minutes 30 seconds, 10 seconds, five seconds, you really begin to comprehend it, you see, because depending on what you're doing, time is different. But when you're in a boxing ring and you're struggling, you're getting your ass kicked and you're tired, you really get a concept of how long three minutes is. And I think after that, you can really value time and make the most of your time, which is extremely important on this earth. So anyways, uh, we got one of our savages in there. Um, who was significantly smaller than Vegas. Vegas is 190 pounds. The Saint, I think, was 155 pounds. So he's going in with a guy who's 155 pounds. Vegas is 190 pounds. They are nowhere near the same weight class. And so they go in there and, um, you know, the guy's been very gentle and, you know, coaching them. And, uh, you know, he's giving Vegas some good work. Now, truth be told, Anytime you're fighting, don't coach. So I want everyone to know you come to one of my things. If you're fighting somebody, don't coach. Just fight. Just you're in there to whoop ass. Just whoop ass. Because frankly, I would have liked to have seen uh, him obliterate Vegas a little better than he did. I thought honestly, I didn't think Vegas was going to make it to a second round. But Vegas had promised one. He had been asking to fight all day, fight me in particular, which I think is bonkers. He'd been asking to fade up with me in particular. And it was almost like he was taunting me too. It was weird. He was like, don't you want to punch me in the face? Don't you want to punch me in the face? I was like, this is very strange. But um, I I, I thought the, the gentleman was just going to obliterate him. <laughs> but he was being kind. He was being too kind, too saintly, in the wrong way. Because <laughs> the right thing is to deal with your enemies effectively. <laughs> so anyways, um, you know, he, he, uh, he he's coaching up Vegas and – He's uh, sparring him, and he gives him some good work. He gives him some good work. You know. And after that, Vegas was like wanting to quit. So that lets you know the Saint gave him some good work. Vegas wanted to quit, and I was like, nah, hell nah. You said that you were going to give us at least two rounds. That's what you said out of your mouth. As a man, you said you do at least two rounds. Now, mind you, a boxing match is, a, a match is 12 rounds or 15 rounds. 12 rounds or 15 rounds. That was only one round. You already promised two rounds as a man. So are you going to be a man of your word or are you going to be a liar? No, oh, I'm not. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh. so I was babbling like a broad. So we made him more of a man that day. We said, hey, stick to your word. And he agreed to do that second round. But honestly, I thought he'd be a little 
I, I thought it'd be a little tougher, but when he started to renege, instead of letting my young boy go in there, I was like, I think I'll take this fade. I think I'll go ahead and take this fade because I think he needs a different kind of lesson. So let me just take this fade real quick. For all of you who are members, and if you're not a member, I highly recommend you become a member now. Now will be the time because I'm going to release the footage of um, Vegas fading up. So um, within, uh, let's say, 15 hours, we're going to upload the footage of basically Vice News uh, getting their ass kicked by the Saint in the, Saint, the Saint in the Center. Yes, the Saint in the Center beating up Vice News. Um, <laughs> bro ended up laid out on uh, the freaking parking lot ground laid out on dirt, dust, and gravel in a parking lot. It was ugly. Uh, but anyway, so he faded up the first guy, uh, the first saint, got some good work, wanted to quit. We told him, this is, you don't quit out here. You said two rounds, you're going to do two rounds. <laughs> then um, he, he gets in with me and I'm, you know, I'm being nice and, you know, being gentle. And, and then, uh, toughen him up a little bit. He tried to run. We had like a man-made fight club ring. So, you know, shout out to uh, Austin, who's a G, because I was watching the footage back and I saw him try to run and I saw Austin pushing back in. And shout out to T, because I was I was body blowing him real vicious. And then he tried to run again. I saw T like box him in. Um, and shout out to Austin as well, because one time he tried to run and I, I, I banged him, but I think Austin also got hit. So I apologize. <laughs> I apologize for that one. Um, but yeah, it, it was, uh, we made a man of him, at least the beginnings of a man. I think that if he continues messing with this ism, I think he'll be a real man and he'll finally feel, feel inner happiness and, and completeness. Cause truth be told with his personality, he's an intelligent gentleman. And, you know, I could tell that at some level, he just wants to fit in and, and be, feel included and feel respected and worthwhile and a part of something like I feel like a a childishness within him and and I don't say that to be insulting and I think that you know if he actually was to give up on his all these beliefs and ideas that he has which are errant and you know just give in to what's real give in to simplicity you know stop being all complex and sophisticated and womanly just just be a simple man I think he'd feel much better and he'd be much more valuable to his family and he'd respect himself more. So hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll pray that he's able to uh, you know, be, become a believer. He'll probably never become a saint, but at least become a believer and start moving in the right direction. Anyways, um, the funny thing is, you know, as I said, I'm still recovering from uh, this man-made uh, sickness that was created by the U.S. and Chinese government in cahoots. And um, as a result, it's a respiratory um, influenza, right? And so obviously I'm muscular, experiencing muscular fatigue and respiratory issues. I can't breathe very well. And still, you know, put on a conference with an hour and a half, of, or excuse me, uh, three hours of sleep the first night, an hour and a half, an hour and a half of sleep the second night, um, spoke for in excess of 16 hours, went out every night with the saints and then last night went out really late with the saints kicked a guy's ass um and, and all that and, and that lets you know like you can do whatever you choose to do and really there's no excuses and that's why i don't take take anyone's excuses i don't accept your excuses when you want to explain to me how you're working two jobs and it's gonna it's unbearable like bro like nobody cares stop it everybody's hustling everybody's struggling who cares <laughs> you dig like go harder. Anytime you hear me share something with you about a challenge, I'm not sharing to get sympathy. I need no sympathy. I want no sympathy. I'm sharing to tell you that there's somebody out here going hard. You dig? There's somebody out here that's going through things like you're going through things, but they're not being a bitch about it. You hear me? They keeping it player and they're going hard. They're not complaining. I mean, hell, summit was over yesterday officially. Um, I didn't have to go out uh, at night with the Saints and hang out and, you know, spit game and spend all that extra time. No, I don't have to do any of that. But there's nothing like being with family. You hear me? There's nothing like being with great men and strong men. And I really enjoyed it. And, you know, I got the super player suite. We got two and a half baths in here. You dig? We got the wraparound balcony. Only one in Vegas with the most gorgeous prized view. You hear me? You can't see the Bellagio fountain, right? Oh, ironically, the Bellagio fountain is going on right now. So you can imagine 
how expensive this view is where you can see the fountain and a full view of the strip. And I'm so G, man, and I show so much love to my people. Cats, you know, catch them a little broad. They're like, bruh. I was like, man, hey, here, take this car. Hey, you take this room key. Hey, do what y'all do. It's plenty of space. Do what y'all do. I'm not going to stay there tonight. You guys can stay there tonight. Enjoy. There's a mini bar, drinks, alcohol in the mini bar, whatever you do, whatever you need. Use the materials you need to call room service for, you know, you and the lady. Hey, enjoy. Have a good time. That's the kind of love I try to show people, man. And you can do that when you're around good people because they don't exploit you. They don't use you. Things will come back to you. Um, and, you know, that's why you accumulate to share with your family. Anyways, um, Saints, I'll give you some time to send in your comments, questions as we wind down. May I acknowledge Cameron, who just became a member. Uh, you will have access to that fade uh, footage of me beating up Vice within 15 hours. And I also acknowledge uh, Fooly Cooley writes, Peace of the Saints, glad I was able to catch a live from you. Came to the realization I can't disclose things to my immediate family anymore. They get like that. Values differ, still lovely. I think there might be a typo here. Values differ. I'm not sure what you mean, Fully Cooley. I must concede. Uh, if you need to send a, a, a version without the typo or perhaps paraphrase it, you can send it to the email below. And I also acknowledge Mr. Chambliss. He writes, it's like those dudes who randomly start lighting, lightly punching you for no reason. Also, ain't no way this man's name is Vegas. That's correct. His name is not Vegas. His name is some Norwegian name that I guess he doesn't feel comfortable asking people to pronounce. And so he shortens it to Vegas. Maybe his last name is Vega, but there's no way his first name. He's like a criminal. Yeah, agree. Lid Jimmy writes, what happened to uh, the rage quit versus 16 year old video? Um, all the videos go for the members. So if you don't see it on your member site, uh, if you'd be kind enough to just send me an email uh, below and CC Jason at marquetism.com, we'll make sure that that is accessible to you. May I also acknowledge Cade. Oh, okay. I see right here. Okay. <laughs> I'm waiting for the email. Oh, yeah. I don't, I don't see an email from you unless I already read it. Okay, I think I'm caught up. All right, Saints, it has been a pleasure to have this time to fellowship with you all. Um, if you're a member, uh, you're going to see that footage of that fade go up within uh, 15 hours. I promise that you will enjoy it. And it's funny as hell, too. Uh, shout out to Paulo. He writes, peace to the big homie. I appreciate you. The, the footage is funny as hell. One, because he keeps falling out in a parking lot, right? And it's just so gutter and grimy, the environment, real fight club shit. And then number two, because every time he gets punched, he's like, ah, ah. <laughs> I thought he was going to throw up, man. I thought he was just going to throw up, bro. It was great. Saints, until next time.